Prices in markets like Toronto and Vancouver moving further out of reach. And you know, they often try and brush it off. This is like some sort of naturally occurring phenomenon that, you know, has just happened and everyone is powerless to do anything about it. And I think that's just complete and utter bullshit. This really is the untold story. Why are housing prices in Canada so incredibly high? Host to some of the most unaffordable cities in the entire world, many young Canadians now struggle to afford a home. But what exactly has been driving these massive increases in price? Have interest rates controlled by the Bank of Canada been kept too low for too long? Has government decisions, including on zoning and immigration, distorted supply and demand? Or have these historic increases in prices simply been a house of cards that's all about to collapse? The combination of low interest rates and inflation is like adding jet fuel to the home prices. We were selling those same houses for 550 grand two years ago. You know, now they're 1.2 million. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. More than just an appreciating asset, home ownership is a rite of passage. In Canada's hot housing market, when a for sale sign goes up, it's quickly replaced with sold. Greater Vancouver area has cooled in recent months. It's still expensive. The average home price more than $1.1 million. Home ownership in Canada is quickly becoming an out of reach fantasy for many Canadians. As the days of being able to afford a quality home in many Canadian cities especially on a single income, are increasingly confined to the past. Put simply, the opportunity afforded previous generations no longer exists, and the problem seems to only be getting worse. Over the past two decades, home prices in Canada have increased by 375%, soaring to a national average of $816,000 in 2022 and over $1 million in British Columbia, a 24% increase in just one year. But even more importantly has been the abject deterioration in the house price to income ratio more commonly referred to as affordability. Since 2005, no other G7 nation has seen the gap between home prices and incomes diverge as much as Canada. And when compared next to the United States, the level of disparity is downright shocking, especially when you consider Canada is the second largest and one of the least densely populated countries in the entire world. And the results of this decrease in affordability are plain for everyone to see. With the recent poll revealing 36% of young Canadians having given up on their dream of home ownership altogether. A feeling as a 32 year old renter, I can certainly relate to. Well, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, ideally, you want house prices to be somewhere about three to four times of, of income. If we look in most of Canada, historically, that's what we've been at. Uh, now, in a Vancouver or Toronto, you get multiples of 12, 15, 20, which is completely unaffordable, uh, particularly if you don't have a fair bit of inherited wealth. Yeah, well, in British Columbia, you're right. I mean, we used to talk about the rain, we used to complain about the Canucks. Now it's all housing affordability all the time. And you walk through neighborhoods, you talk to uh, other homeowners, they know what every single house is sold for and when and to who and, uh, and what it means for their own uh, pocketbook. Big cities like Vancouver and Toronto have seen some of the largest price increases in the country, as houses that might otherwise be reserved for lower income Canadians have been selling for ridiculous prices. But this crisis in affordability isn't restricted to large metropolitan centers. The same is happening in many smaller cities too, like Victoria, my hometown. I met with the local real estate agent, Alex Carroll, to get a sense of how house prices have changed in this community. From Victoria all the way up to the Malahat, we've seen prices grow by 71%. That's detached homes in the last five years. In the last five years, 71%, and that's kind of Victoria, the greater Victoria area. Victoria as a whole. As yeah. a whole. And of that, 65% in the last three years. So actually the one right behind us here, um, I helped clients sell mm -hmm. uh, just a couple months ago. Yeah. They sold for 1.848. 
um, but actually purchased the home for less than a million dollars in 2016 wow. for about 950000 or so. Wow. So that's price of that home almost doubled in five, six years. Yep. This rapid and unprecedented rise in home prices across Canada begs the obvious question. What's driving this increase in prices? And is there something we can do to get them under control? Well, just like any other um, item, it really is driven by demand and supply. This is basic economics. And uh, the problem we have is we've been restricting supply with all kinds of measures. Uh, usually artificial measures and artificially restricting supply. Um, and in doing so, the only uh, way for the market to respond is to increase prices. That's, that's really the only possible outcome. Just like any other economic good, supply and demand determine the price of housing. If there is an increased demand for homes without an equal increase in supply, housing prices will go up. It is, quite literally, Economics 101. So what exactly has been happening to the supply and demand of housing in Canada? You know, the supply has dwindled, the demand has grown. British Columbia and Vancouver specifically is a very desirable place to live. And so you just don't have enough of the product you need in order to house everyone who wants it. It's not normal in economics that you would see persistently high prices in housing and no supply response. Mm -hmm. Uh, experts estimate that we are about one million homes short of being able to meet demand. What happened? Why can't we build those million homes? Prices were high. There, you know, the market was signaling we need more resources going into housing. Why didn't the, the market react? Well, because the market wasn't allowed to react because cities wouldn't allow homes to be built. Yeah, local governments are terrible for NIMBYism. Not in my backyard, uh, stopping everything they possibly can. Every week it feels like, you know, you read of another couple councils who have turned down perfectly good projects simply because of a very minor issue. Provincial and municipal governments are the main cause of the, the high houses, housing prices. It's, um, I mean, that's obviously a contributing factor, but to me this is the main cause and, and this works through restricting supply. Quite simply, municipal governments in Canada restrict the supply of housing by creating artificial obstacles in the way of certain kinds of development. The first hurdle to be overcome are regulations around zoning, which determines what can be built in a particular area, whether it be residential, commercial or industrial. Consider a terminal avenue between Science World and, and uh, Home Depot in Vancouver, right? So that's a pretty nice stretch, walking distance to downtown. It is part of downtown. That's largely industrial land. Why is that still industrial, really basically parking lots and car dealerships? So, so there are large pockets like this right in Vancouver that, that are underutilized. Uh, and even if you are totally within your existing zoning and everything, it's no secret that uh, approvals at, uh, in Vancouver uh, take, take years. Even after a proposed project is zoned correctly, in many instances, the bureaucratic hurdles facing new construction are only just beginning. A fact made abundantly clear to me after speaking with the president and CEO of Reliance Properties, John Stovall. This building behind us is, is called the Northern Junk and it's got that name because it used to be a, a junkyard dealer. Um, it's a, a property that we bought in 2010 from, and, and at that time the building had been vacant for 30 odd years. The family who owned it just didn't want to do anything with it. And here we are 12 years later. Uh, last August we finally got our permit to redevelop this property and add much needed housing. And even now a year later we're still waiting for our building permit. So from the kind of period of first paper submission to shovels in the ground. That was how long exactly? It'll actually, be, it'll be about 13 years. 13 yeah. years? Yeah, yeah. It's not uncommon now to wait longer for your building permit than it takes to actually build the building that you're getting the permit for. Really? And that's a huge carrying cost, right? You talk about affordable housing, think of the carrying cost, the mortgage on that property, having to keep people in trades kind of at bay waiting and, and trying to get supplies. The significant delays imposed on new construction by government create a tremendous deal of uncertainty for those developing the project, leading to less people willing to take on expensive housing builds or demanding a higher return if they do. So there's too many risks is what it is. Like to, to develop, is, it's a risky business, super risky. Yeah. And when you start adding supply chain issues, um, 
rising material costs that are completely out of your control and you just take it on the chin. The effect of these delays on the cost of housing are, are immeasurable. You know, typically a developer will purchase land or an existing building to renovate for housing, you know, with an element of borrowed money. That's just the way the real estate industry works. Mm -hmm. So the longer you have to carry that acquisition loan up until the point you're ready to deliver construction, that's just a linear increase in costs. And more recently, you know, we've had projects that while we're waiting for permits in the last 24 months, where construction costs have gone up by almost 35%. So wow. if we'd started them, you know, two years ago, we'd have been able to sell them for less. Material and labor is probably up 20% year over year, so um, as you can imagine what that does to your bottom line. In addition to the cost of delays and bureaucratic red tape, government increases the price of new housing construction in another more traditional way as well, taxing the bejesus out of it. One of the most identifiable increases in development costs are, are taxes and government charges. You know, in 2018, I did a study of, of uh, what uh, the government charges and taxes were as a percentage of a home and it was 26 percent uh, so 26 percent of your purchase price is going to the government through taxation and, and charges so i've uh, recently updated that and we're just finalizing our numbers but we're well over 30 percent now the problem with government is they tax housing like they're taxing cigarettes you know there's all sorts of crazy taxes on cigarettes because they're trying to get rid of smoking okay but why are we taxing housing the same way? We're not trying to get rid of housing, we should be trying to get more housing. We, we can't tax our way to affordability, and yet government continually <laughs> tries to do it. But if the price of housing is truly determined by supply and demand, then surely government restricting supply is only half of the story. What about demand? Specifically, the often decried speculators, foreign or otherwise, who are commonly accused of inflating the price of homes. We know their speculation, and that's going to happen in any market where that uh, you see shortages in, in price increases, right? That if housing prices are going up 10, 15, 20% a year, that's gonna attract investors and speculators, and that 20% that increase quickly turns into a 40% one. It's for this reason, the government of BC introduced a speculation tax in 2018 hoping to disincentivize speculators from buying up much needed housing supply simply to expand their portfolio wealth. But since that time, house prices have only increased, leading to the obvious question, do speculation taxes actually work to bring down home prices? Sounds like a great tax, I mean, who doesn't want to tax speculators? Yeah. But it doesn't actually accomplish what they said it would accomplish. And the truth is, government doesn't really care. It's not about you know, changing the price of housing or finding, you know, generating revenue for housing. It's just about getting as much money into general revenue as possible. So it's nebulous. And they get to walk around and say, well, we are taxing speculators. Isn't that great? But there's no proof and there's certainly no evidence that it's actually made housing more affordable. The issue is, it adds another source of uncertainty for, uh, for any builder or any, any investor in, in real estate. So the net effect is actually, sure, we, we may convert more units from being empty potentially to, to being occupied, but then we're building fewer units. In addition to targeting speculation, governments across Canada have become concerned about money being pumped into the housing market for reasons more sinister than simply turning a profit. In 2020, Criminal Intelligence Service Canada found that criminal elements were using the Canadian real estate market to launder billions of dollars. CISC found that criminals were, quote, manipulating property values and obtaining loans against overvalued real estate that are paid using proceeds of crime. In other words, criminals are bidding up housing prices to launder the maximum amount of money an issue that has frustrated many Canadians, but maybe none more so than the vocal and passionate mayor of Port Coquitlam, Brad West. But when you've got billions of dollars, um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, sloshing around uh, in this uh, dirty blood money that's being laundered, including in the housing market, law-abiding, hard-working, normal people get hurt by it because they're having to compete with it. Because, you know, if someone is buying uh, real estate with money that uh, they've gone illegally, they're not particularly concerned about you know, getting the 
the best possible deal. I mean, these people were paying in, in at times they were paying in cash, um, and it, it sets a standard that uh, then cascades throughout the uh, rest of the housing market. How is your regular working person who does everything right supposed to square up against that? The impact on demand from money laundering and speculation may or may not be substantial, but there is no denying that the largest impact on demand for housing is simply there are more people looking to purchase a home. This increase in demand, coupled with restraints placed on supply, is what's driving up housing prices dramatically. That's yeah, an important question, and I think we can look at like what what makes Vancouver different than Edmonton, what makes Victoria different than, than Winnipeg, and the simple answer is places where the population is growing faster than housing are, are seeing those those price increases. No, there's other things that are going on here that um, you know that are explaining this, um, and I think you identify uh, one that does a lot of people. Uh, especially in the political establishment, don't want to go anywhere near, uh, and that is uh, the level of immigration to our country uh, is at record levels. Immigration into Canada is on pace to reach a record high in 2022, with 431,000 new permanent residents expected to arrive, and nearly half a million expected the year after that. That represents an 80% increase from just 15 years ago, and more than three times the number per capita as welcomed by the United States. It's obvious to see how this increase in population will massively increase demand for housing, and without an equal increase in supply, house prices will continue to rise. It seems like the federal government's agenda of massively increasing immigration is at odds with the plans of many municipalities to restrict the development of new homes. We have a federal government that wants to let a half a million people a year into Canada. We have in British Columbia 110,000 immigrants last year, which is a staggering amount. And uh, we have a seasonal workforce in BC of 150,000. Um, those federal policies are going to cause this problem to continue to be protracted because we don't have housing to meet today's demand, let alone another 110,000 people coming next year. We had, you know, historically more 30, 40,000. We're tripling that number. Our problem is just a, a classic one of, you know, the federal government making decisions there and our provinces, particularly Ontario and BC, not filtering that through into their, their housing supply decisions and then those not getting filtered through to a municipal side. Now I happen to believe that immigration is a good and important thing for a country. I also think a country is a allowed to determine what an appropriate level of immigration is. In recent times um, you have seen you know just this move to say that you know, the answer is always to, to increase despite the fact that it comes with it a number of considerations, like where are you gonna house all these people? Mm -hmm. So what's the solution to all of this? How can we keep the housing market affordable while facing a massive surge in population? To find out, I went somewhere that has dealt with this exact problem and came out ahead. So we're here in Lankford, British Columbia, the city that I grew up in and watched as it radically transformed over the past 30 years. This used to be the rougher, poorer part of Victoria, but since that time, its population has tripled, its economy exploded, and yet it still has some of the most affordable homes and housing in all of Greater Victoria and really all of British Columbia. But how exactly did they make that happen? Let's go chat with the mayor, Mr. Stu Young, who's been mayor for 30 years and see what he has to say. Langford's welcomed probably from a percentage increase, almost more new people than, than almost any other municipality in the province, if not more than any other. And yet it's still, in the Victoria context, has the reputation for having some of the most affordable uh, housing and homes. So uh, how did you do that? Or what are, what are some of the key components? Well, the simple thing is, is get rid of red tape bureaucracy. If you take five years to rezone a piece of property in a municipality, you're pretty well killing economic development. You know? So we try and have a fast process. And as long as we uh, 
build supply. That's the biggest thing, is making sure there's supply for people to buy, which then keeps the prices a little bit more stable. But this wasn't always the way Langford was. Before Stu Young became mayor 30 years ago, Langford was known for its high unemployment rate and lack of opportunity. That has now completely reversed, and over the past five years, it's been the fastest growing municipality in all of BC, and the third fastest in the entire country. People didn't want to move to Langford before. They were leaving Langford when I was growing up. And it's because we had 20% unemployment, you know, and things were terrible, you know. We were called dog patch growing up, you know what I mean? So uh, we had to fix that. If you want a vibrant community, then don't take three or four years for a rezoning and don't put a bunch of roadblocks up that create problems in the process. You know, you're not going to build affordable housing if it takes four years to do it, but I can tell you the municipality is very uh, good when it comes to speeding things up. Well, at Langford, you can get a building through in six months, eight months. Really? Yeah. Downtown Victoria, um, you know, yeah, it can be anywhere from three to five years. And it's weird, it seems also like with the developers and the builders, it's in other municipalities that we've been to, it seems like almost an adversarial relationship, whereas here it seems more like a partnership. Well, 100%, I mean, that's, that's how you build a community. You know, Langford's done just a fabulous job of that. They, they really have. I mean, I, I, I don't know a better example to, yeah. you know, to even compare Langford to yeah. across Canada. I think only if we had uh, just got to increase the supply of competent politicians and we'll... Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, I say this all the time. But there is something that is completely out of the control of municipalities. In fact, for the most part, it's completely out of the control of any level of government. And that's the interest rate set by the Bank of Canada. Since the 2008 financial crisis, Canada has seen historically low interest rates. This was a policy implemented by our central bank to allow commercial banks to borrow money for cheap from the Bank of Canada. In turn, these commercial banks could reduce their interest rates and allow Canadians to acquire cheap credit for things like mortgages. In response, housing prices rose as the aggregate demand for homes increased and Canadians were able to qualify for larger loans, leading to bidding wars and an increase in dangerous variable rate mortgages, a type of mortgage where the interest rate fluctuates depending on the actions of the Bank of Canada. And it's pretty simple. I think everyone understands that when rates are low, people can borrow more, it's more easier to service the debt. So on the same income, you can afford to pay more and most people do. The most important thing for housing, like it's, it's very rate sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of cheap money and credit over the last couple of years has obviously driven a lot of dollars into hard assets, mm -hmm. um, real estate being one of them. Mm -hmm. But these record low interest rates are not guaranteed to last forever. In fact, in an attempt to cool inflation, the Bank of Canada has already begun to increase rates. This should have the effect of lowering demand for mortgages and thus lowering the price of housing but it also risks ensnaring people with variable rate loans who have already seen their monthly payments jump significantly, which, if left unchecked, could trigger a catastrophic train of mortgage defaults. When interest rates are low, increases from that point, even small increases, are very consequential. It's one thing to have interest rates at 10% to go to 11 no one really uh, notices that, but when you have interest rates at 1% and they go to 2, so the same 1 percentage point increase, that's huge. Interest rates drive what people can pay. It, it's going to have a dramatic impact on the ability of people to borrow money. And, and people are going to be handing their keys in, because, yeah. you know, interest rates go up another, they're saying it might even go up, jump a point coming yeah. up, and uh, that, that's going to absolutely decimate families. It is the one sure thing that will change the price of housing is interest rates, for sure. But will depressed housing prices caused by the increase in interest rates actually make housing any more affordable for most Canadians? Uh, so mortgage rates have gone up uh, in the last uh, four weeks about 150 basis points, which is, which is absolutely massive. So London, Ontario, our house prices went down $50,000 in a single month. 
Right. Yeah, um, so about a 7% decrease. I think the problem is that that's not going to help that much with the affordability uh, issue, particularly for uh, first time home buyers, because basically, yeah, the sticker price is lower, but now I'm paying higher mortgage payments. So it, it might help a little bit on the down payment side, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, the monthly payments, if anything, are going to rise because it's like, Okay, yeah, uh, the, the, the principal payments are 20% less, but now my, my interest payments have, have doubled. So I think we are going to see cool downs in some markets because of those higher interest rates, but we're essentially trading off one problem for another. So what if you cut your house for two or $300,000 less if your mortgage payment is still 25% higher? For previous generations of Canadians, owning your own home was a distinctly attainable dream, something that could be aspired to and, with hard work, easily achieved. But for many young Canadians today, that dream is rapidly slipping away. Canada's housing market and its level of unaffordability is not normal, and some cities like Vancouver and Toronto are among the least affordable in the entire world. And it's not by accident. Politicians have made decisions, and we, as Canadians, are living with the results. Fortunately, there are some who are fighting back. This annoys the hell out of me, is this idea that um, if you're a, a younger person, and I'm in my 30s as well, that, um, well, you just, you don't want a house. You don't want a backyard. You don't want any little patch of grass. You don't want, you know, uh, you like living in 500 square feet, you know, uh, that's what young people want and so we shouldn't concern ourselves with, you know, the type of housing that you could actually raise a family in because young people don't want to have families. They don't want to have kids. They don't want a backyard. Uh, and I think that's just complete and utter bullshit. I'm not ready to give up um, like a lot of people seem to want to do and people won't put up with it, you know. It, the, the frustration um, and disappointment um, is already turning to anger for a lot of people. But if you're interested in a future for our kids, for our communities, uh, we have got to find ways uh, to reestablish the connection between our local economic conditions and the wages and salaries that people the average person make uh, and the ability to own a home. You know, everybody deserves a job, everybody deserves a house, and if you work hard for it, you should be able to attain that, and that's really what politicians should be focusing on. We need to make sure that housing never gets out of reach for people. That's our job as a politician. Uh, we should not be putting roadblocks in front of it. Our job is to make sure that housing is affordable and everybody has the opportunity to have a house. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.